Well, I think we'll get started. Good day, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's Folio Forum, which is sponsored by the Open Library Environment in partnership with EBSCO and Index Data. Uh, my name is Peter Murray, and I am the open source community advocate at Index Data and the moderator for today's event. Uh, today's forum is an end of the year review of the Folio project. Uh, this session, like all Folio forums, is being recorded and will be posted to the Open Library Environment website. Uh, as an open forum, participants can see each other and the questions submitted. And we've muted everyone except for the speakers to ensure good sound quality. Uh, we value your participation and do encourage you to engage in the topic. Uh, use the question box within Zoom uh, to enter questions and comments as they come to you. Uh, if you like to tweet, uh, please use the hashtag Folio Forum, and I can relay those comments and questions to the panelists as well. We also encourage you to continue the conversation on today's topic on the Folio discussion website, discuss.folio.org. Um, Let's start uh, today's forum with a look back at some of the quantitative measurements uh, of the project. Uh, my involvement with the Folio project started about a year and a half ago. So um, I remember, for instance, when the number of developers uh, and the number of subject matter experts were in the low single digits. Uh, that was also a time when we only had one user experience designer. Uh, now there's an expanding number of developers and subject matter experts. Uh, the number of libraries and service providers in the Folio community uh, has certainly increased. Uh, and part of my job, uh, as part of my job, I'm involved in conversations about how to integrate new libraries and service providers into the project. Uh, so one of the exciting parts of a project like this is uh, reforming our existing tools and processes and inventing new tools and processes to meet the needs of our growing project. I think it's also interesting uh, the kinds of expressions of interests we're getting from national libraries, uh, such as Sweden uh, and Denmark and Finland. Uh, Hungary has a request for proposals out for a national library catalog, uh, and Folio is one of the options under consideration. Uh, in the US, the Library of Congress is in an exploration phase for a new library system, and Folio is one of the systems they're looking at. Uh, here are some more raw numbers. Uh, and for me, what is exciting here uh, is the number of speaking engagements and the number of community meetups. Uh, the speaking engagements are exciting because behind that number 46 uh, is a growing cadre of subject matter experts who are talking about developments in the Folio project and what it'll mean for their libraries. Uh, the community meetups are exciting because the geographic span of where these are happening, and we have a slide that lists these meetups. The, the dots on the map show uh, a high concentration of events in Europe and a number of overlapping dots in the northeastern part of the US. Uh, there's also interest in the project from Australia and South America. Um, it, there's interest in the project from all over. Uh, these are the places that have organized meetups and uh, we certainly expect more meetups to happen in 2018. As those working on the project know that the beating heart of Folio is in the special interest groups. Uh, in this first year of active SIGs, we've charted, chartered uh, 17, uh, sorry, 11 uh, special interest groups that focus on specific areas of the project. Uh, they meet as often as twice a week. 
uh, and as infrequently as once a month. Uh, some have done a chunk of work and have now uh, suspended their activity until parts of the project catch up with them. Uh, some, like the accessibility and the system operation and management SIGs, uh, just got going in the last two months. Uh, the Product Council has an ongoing discussion about a SIG for Special Collections and Archives, uh, and there is interest in having a SIG that looks at how repositories integrate with Folio. Uh, so I expect more special interest groups to be created in 2018. Along with the growth of subject matter experts in the project, we've seen a steady growth of developers creating software for the Folio platform. Uh, this chart comes from Harry Kaplanian at EBSCO, uh, and it shows the growth of the number of developers writing code. Uh, I don't expect this trend to slow down next year. Uh, in fact, uh, we'll have the challenge of coordinating uh, a growing number of development teams uh, with the addition of the development team funded by the Mellon Foundation grant to Olay and the expressions of interests that we've already received from other universities and service providers. Uh, where we started the year with one user experience designer and one product owner, we now have a team of designers and product owners that coordinate their efforts uh, across the development teams. Here's a list of where the designers and developers are coming from. Uh, and I think it's a, a healthy mix of libraries, library consortia, and service providers. The developers are in their 28th sprint cycle. Uh, and are closing in on the alpha release early next year and working towards the beta release in the summer. The developers have had two in-person meetings with a third coming up in January. The team of product owners is also gearing up a, a testing group that will review the functionality being developed uh, for the core Folio apps. So with that introduction, it's my pleasure to introduce today's panelists. I think I've got this order correct from left to right. Uh, Christopher Spaulding is Vice President of Open Source Platforms and Communities at EBSCO. Uh, Michael Winkler is the Managing Director for the Olay Partners. And Sebastian Hammer is the president and co-founder of Index Data. We want to take questions uh, from the audience for our panelists. So I'll remind you that you can use the Q&A box in Zoom uh, to ask questions and make comments. And I will relay those to the panelists. You can also tweet using the hashtag Folio Forum, and those will be relayed as well. I see the three of you have found a cozy room at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC. Uh, I, you were there for the Coalition for Network Information Fall Briefing earlier this week, uh, which means that you are all also in the same room at the same time. That's a little rare for <laughs> our project uh, as distributed as this is. Uh, so we'll take advantage of that. So the three of you were there from the start of the project. Uh, what do you think about these state of the project numbers? Who can start? <clears throat> well, I'll start out because uh, I think uh, all of us probably have different um, perspectives on this, but uh, would end up saying probably something very similar about the last 12 months uh, being all about growth and just substantial growth. Uh, somewhat surprising how quickly teams came together, how uh, quickly new organizations uh, uh, became interested in Folio, and how quickly the community, the active community, um, with, with very little structure, organized itself uh, around um, a quick, turnaround on specifications, on code, on ideas, uh, on discussions, and, and 
really everyone put their shoulders uh, against the, the millstone and, and pushed hard uh, to get as far as we've gotten in this year. And I think we can describe a little of, of what some of those accomplishments have been. I think from, from, uh, from my perspective, coming from the development sides, uh, the, the, one of the numbers that, that wasn't on your slides, Peter, uh, we started this year just having sort of completed being in the middle of the work on the first app in Folio. We had mm. spent uh, uh, 2016 building the platform and, and beginning a transition from platform building to application building. And, and I was just trying to do sort of a, a rough count uh, a moment ago. And I think we currently have somewhere around 20 apps in the pipeline, somewhere between UX uh, design analysis, implementation testing. So we've gone from, from really a mode where we were primarily building infrastructure to being solidly in the middle of, of producing apps um, in parallel with multiple teams. Uh, which just to me is really it's, it's really exciting and really impressive. I think for me, the um, uh, over this past year of watching uh, the meetups and the amount of, of libraries that are, are, are attending these meetups that are showing up uh, with interest where, you know, a year and a half ago, it would be, uh, you know, five to 10 librarians in a room. And now we will fill Mr. Kaku was saying was over 120, 120 for two days, which is um, amazing. Uh, uh, I think the other piece is, um, which I, I'm not sure was in, in the, the slides, but the, uh, the ideation that happens on Slack, the communication that's happening on uh, mm. Slack, uh, you know, we have over 400 to 450 people signed up. I would say there's about 80 that are constant users. The thing mm -hmm. that really struck me was that over um, you know, over a hundred thousand chats just tells you how active uh, the the community is in, in uh, communicating with each other. I think the thing uh, the same thing could be said for discuss too. The use of discuss uh, in the in the very beginning it was a difficult pivot for a lot of people who were used to using wikis in different ways. Um, uh, and that's turned out to be a real success. I have no idea what the numbers are, Peter. You might know better than I do. Uh, but, but many discussions may begin in Slack, but they tend to move to discuss when there is something substantial that needs to be established or worked through with a group of people. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the number of people who, in the beginning, there were fewer voices. Uh, there were lots of people there who were lurking and listening. But now there's many, many active uh, participants and discussions going on simultaneously. You know, and and uh, to that point, actually, as well, within uh, Discuss, which has been very exciting, is we, we started to talk about the beginning of the project that we have institutions uh, joining in, institutions as saying, we will commit as an institution to be part of this project. But what we're starting to see within both Slack and within Discuss is uh, librarians from institutions that haven't declared that they're part of this. And mm -hmm. even in some cases, some designers that, that are not even associated with an institution, but they look at this project as something uh, interesting and something that they'd like to partake in. And I think also hiding, hiding behind your numbers, Peter, is, is I think they don't quite show the extent to which this effort is focused and coordinated. You know, these are people that, these organizations and individuals that are participating professionally and and in most cases more than half of the time to folio uh, I've attended as, as you have Peter two developer meetings all hands developer meetings mm -hmm. this year the first one I think had around 30 participants and it felt very much like it was index data and some friends and the second meeting uh, this fall was what was it, 50 60 people mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it felt like a conference in one way but also a very focused meeting with all of these new new colleagues coming in and talking about Folia, talking about the platform that, that, that we've started. Uh, that was a, a, a big moment for me, just the sense of growth, how quick it's been. That, that sense of growth, uh, where do you think that's going to, to lead uh, in the next year? Uh, you know, we, we've, the, the one, chart that was in that that presentation was showing that the growth of developers and and that initial 
uh, small pool of, of index data uh, people and, and then just growing to where the, you know, the index data people were just a, a small part of uh, a much larger whole. I, where do you see the, the growth areas uh, occurring in 2018? Um, I, I think we're just going to continue seeing growth in all of the areas that we've just highlighted. I would expect more developers to come to it. There may be a changing nature of those developers. Uh, there may be more organic development that we see as the platform has stabilized and is, is uh, available to, to developers to push around. Uh, so we may you know, end up finding folio uses that, that were not spun out of this core group. Mm. Um, but I would expect more development teams to want to join into the core effort and, and to work on apps uh, that libraries need. Uh, and to look at these new areas uh, uh, of interest that libraries have around the software. Yeah, uh, that's an interesting point. It just, uh, you know, it tickled uh, uh, something in my memory that uh, we heard coming out of the uh, linked data in libraries meeting uh, last week that uh, we really haven't had yet, uh, really a chance to report to product council yet. Uh, but that was a, a university, I think in Germany uh, that has already started developing an ERM-like application using linked data uh, in Folio. And, you know, to, to those of us that have been living Folio day to day, this was news that this library was out there doing this. And, and wonderful news, too, because that's what <laughs> yes. we want to hear, uh, is that people are picking up the platform uh, or looking at the apps that have been written and saying, you know, uh, this is interesting, let's do something with this. Well, I think everybody working in open source software, creating and, and sharing open source software, sort of realize that often 80% of the activity around the software happens, you don't see it. It's a tip of the iceberg sort of thing. And, and it's been, it was, it was a surprise to me as well, Peter, hearing about the group in, I think it was Leipzig. I think so, because, yeah. Because it means that in some sense, Folio has arrived. It's still very early days and the platform is evolving fast. But, but I think this year we will see many more teams picking it up and doing things with it without necessarily coordinating with, um, uh, with the core team that's working on Folio. And hopefully some of them will come and join the core team or contribute in other ways. Yeah, around growth, we, we know that this coming year we have organizations like Callus in China uh, bringing in uh, a parallel um, uh, dev team to, to add to development. And organizations like uh, um, Image or IBICT in Brazil as well coming to the project. But it's this organic piece that is really exciting that even this, um, this last week, uh, I was talking to the University of Alabama and uh, they had internally have been starting to talk about um, uh, the, the uh, stripes, the, the, the UI toolkit. And their interest in uh, React and Redux there that they're starting to look at strategies around the rest of their websites. Is this an opportunity to look at different ways of developing uh, internally? So it's not just even just the organic piece I'm building on top of Folio, but it's starting this, this other movement of you know, organizations starting to strategize around if we're going to work in this space, are there other things that will, will take us other directions as well? If I could just say, uh, you know, so we, we've all just touched on like growth in the development team, but the other thing that I would expect to continue is the growth in the number of librarians who are engaged in it as well. And, and it will probably mirror the way we just described developers. There will be librarians who are part of this core effort, uh, who are really shaping the platform and, and uh, the, the apps that are on our roadmap right now. And there will be groups of librarians who are begin looking at other areas of interest and, and concern in libraries. Uh, when you talk about the, the special collections SIG, for example, that is functionality for that group is not really on our roadmap. Uh, but by getting a SIG together who can look at what, what the platform can do uh, for libraries and to begin thinking about the kinds of functionality that they would like to have or, or need to have, uh, new ideas will be born out of that and maybe even new apps or or constructs. Exactly. Well, that really gets to the heart of the, the platform concept, doesn't it? That, uh, uh, that the, this development effort doesn't have to be coordinated, that 
you know, we, we often use the example of the iPhone that uh, the, uh, the, the creator of, uh, well, you, you know, I don't know, Facebook is not uh, coordinating with uh, uh, the, the Apple with the calendar app. Uh, yet these apps play along nicely. Uh, and that's really a distinctive aspect of the Folio platform is that there can be this loose coordination of activities and activity can just pop up as, as the, the interest dictates. That's exactly right, Peter. I think one of, one of my really, one of, one of my earliest sort of realizations or, or, or sort of pops of excitement around Folio came from realizing that, that building Folio as a platform really made it fundamentally different when it came to, to the type of community or the type of, of, uh, of, of group or modes of collaborations that it could support because we don't all have to be working in a coordinated way around the same roadmap. In fact, when we constructed, when we designed this notion of the SIGs as the organizing principle of the project, it was very much with a mind towards allowing for organic growth within a community. People don't have to, to coordinate with, with the, the core folio community if they don't want to, but, but the idea was to have a structure that would allow them to do so, and that would allow growth into other areas. Well, and, and it's subtle, uh, you know, because we've talked about how this can be organic and, and uncoordinated, but in fact, the desire to coordinate is what the SIGs uh, exist for is mm. a group of, of interested individuals would come together uh, and say this is an issue that we think is important and that needs to be addressed. So the SIGs represent some kind of loosely coupled coordination within the project anyway. Uh, what I'm really excited about and, and a little bit worried about too is the completely uncoordinated uh, uh, <laughs> that can come in um, and they could be really exciting and interesting uh, but you know uh, we don't know what they are. <laughs> it's very different than anything I've ever worked on where you have generally you have a, a, a central strategy and, and that strategy uh, the whole project comes around and you deliver something to the market with a specific strategy. Well, we have a strategy within the core uh, group right now of we need to deliver something with ILS functionality to run the business. But there's these other conversations going on of what are these other pieces that, that can be built on top of uh, the platform that can leverage pieces of the platform. There's a, th those conversations are happening within the community, but we know that there's, there's other groups and other vendors and other institutions that are, are, uh, are thinking through their own strategies of how they'll use the platform. And that's what's going to be so interesting about this, that decentralized aspect of it. Yeah. I mean, one, one of the ideas that, that I think we from Index Data brought into Folio early on was the, the, the sort of foundational idea that open source software is a hub or an enabler of conversations. It enables different groups, developers, organizations, individuals, librarians, to talk about problems in different ways. There's always been an ambition of the project of this group to try to enable that and to foster that. And so, so in some ways, you know, we'd like to attract, and it's always been attention because we'd like to attract that conversation to the community. We'd like to be part of all the conversations, <laughs> but also recognizing that there will be decentral, there'll be conversations happening that we're not part of, which is part of the fun in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In, in many ways, to that point as well, is that um, over you know, a year and a half ago, I felt like we were part of every single conversation right. mm. uh, in the project that, that you know, as we were, especially around um, uh, uh, vision and trying to get people to really glom on to the initial vision. Yeah. But over time, uh, there's so much going on in the project and there's so much activity that every day I hear about new things that I, I didn't know about it and I wasn't part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Same here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 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 you know, one of the things that has happened over this uh, last 12 months is uh, the community is really stepping up and beginning to, to work with this very loose construct that we've given them uh, and organize themselves and set direction and, and make decisions about how uh, they want to work together um, and the things that they want to work together on. So, it, you know, we're not part of those conversations because that's just happening within the SIGs or within the broad council. 
uh, within the developers group uh, and, and even beyond that uh, in conversations that we would never have been part of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a, a question that that came into the to the Q and A box that's related to this and and to the uh, uh, list of of organizations that are, are coming into the project, uh, and that is uh, JISC uh, in the UK uh, recently announced their involvement uh, in the Folio project. Uh, and although the three of you are not members of of JISC, and so. Uh, uh, maybe we can ask you to uh, to channel them uh, and and speak to the the part that they uh, that just expects to play uh, in the project moving forward. Sure. Do you want to try? I, I um, I'm not very good at uh, channeling. <laughs> uh, but, um, I can I can go more towards uh, conversations that we've had with Jisk, uh and and their um, their initial interest part of it was around they uh, they appreciate the approach uh, the architecture of the the solution and really looking at ways that um, uh, uh, are there opportunities for just to be able to use building blocks that are part of the microservices that are part of the architecture as they either uh, move services over or refactor or or you know build from uh, build new services. I think the um, uh, I think the other piece, though, was that they wanted to be part of um, you know, those conversations around library futures. Those those pieces of where are we headed? Is uh, uh, if I have this large community that has uh, interest in those directions, uh, how can we you know those economies of scale? How can we work together to to deliver uh, towards that? I think that's exactly right. I remember early conversations with JISC and the project, uh, between JISC and the project, and, and it really centered around ways that libraries and organizations can play a role in supporting learning outcomes and scholarly communication. And both of those, I think, we see as, as the big future trends and the big future directions for Folio, you know, beyond supporting current library workflows. And it sort of resonated very directly with JISC's mission. Mm. I think one of the uh, our last meeting with them in, in the UK, one of the things they brought to the table was that they would, uh, they're looking to actually engage with the SIGs as a service provider for feedback. Um, oh. so the initial, uh, initial engagement will be ways that they can uh, partake, but in a way that uh, advising um, from a service provider type of approach or position. Yeah, that's a that's a, a valuable approach. Uh, the uh, the in addition to to Folio uh, apps being developed uh, out there, Folio service providers can uh, can pop up anywhere. Uh, the the uh, nature of of the uh, open source license that we're using uh, means that those those reins are are pretty loose. Uh, uh, with what service providers can do. And, and we keep dancing around. I mean, service providers and service platform, these things are, are sort of made for each other, really. Uh, and organizations like JISC or GBD, HBZ, Flow, uh, who are part of the project, they, they really want to look at the service uh, metrics that they can offer to their clients. Um, and it's easier um, uh, to think about what those will do, how to coordinate those internally and, and to really run a good business model if you're using some kind of a platform, a service platform uh, that you can use and reuse uh, for different kinds of functionality. Mm -hmm. And I think one of, one of our expectations, and I don't know if this will end up being a role that this plays, but in our early conversations about Folio, we had the notion too that you could imagine local hubs of activity arise in, in regions or even around specialities of libraries. And, and we've seen, we've, we've seen JISC members looking to JISC potentially playing that role. And Michael and I, a few months ago, were both in, uh, in Germany for an event hosted by uh, GBD. And as we said, the two network, German networks that participate in Foley and contribute developers. And there was very much a sense of a, a local, very vibrant conversation that really had nothing to do with what's going on in, in, in North America or in, in the rest of the world. But, but supports it and, and, uh, and, and reinforces it. 
it's always been sort of an open question amongst us. I think the balance between a global community in Folio, but also the recognition that their time zone differences, their language differences, their cultural issues that, that supports the idea of local focal points for participation in Folio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Peter, you and I were at Open Repositories this last year, and that was very much um, uh, the, the view of Caval as well in Australia, was that they would be able to uh, uh, support or be a, a center point for, um, for a local SIG uh, that, that looks at uh, needs within the Australian market, especially towards uh, repositories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So has there been a, a standout moment for you over the past year? It's been so many. <laughs> I mean, it really is. And, you know, it's, it's almost like you could just uh, tick off things like, we, you know, we started off the, the forum that we're on right now, and we didn't know if anybody would come. We didn't know if we could generate uh, enough content. Uh, and there were times that we were really struggling to, to generate some of that content. And, and then, and Peter, you know this uh, from being on that organizing group, there are times when we have so much content that we're planning six months out Mm -hmm. uh, on these forums. So, you know, that's just one example of, of kind of the standout moments of, of people really coming to it and taking responsibility um, and, and wanting, you know, their piece of the project, their contribution to the project to be truly open and collaborative um, and, and, and impactful in the project to have a good effect on what's going on. Yeah, I'm, I'm noticing, uh, keeping my eye on the, the participant count, uh, and I think we've uh, overrun our, our Zoom license, and so we're going to have uh, people tuning in on the recording for this, uh, um, kind of beyond our wildest expectations. We were, um, yes, that's one of those metrics. <laughs> <laughs> We, uh, we were talking as we were setting up for this um, of how much has happened in the last year um, that it, it feels like we compacted, you know, three years in one with the amount of, with the amount of development that's been done, the, uh, the work, uh, the amount of work that the SIGs have done, uh, the meetups. Uh, for me, though, one of the, the really, uh, the moments that, that really struck me was, um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the initial meetups were, you know, five, ten, um, although the, the very first one in Copenhagen was we, we put out a, you know, an invite for thinking about five and 60 people showed up, uh, which was great. Uh, but I had a, uh, I had a, a trip into uh, Colombia, um, into Medellin and Bogota, uh, where um, I, I didn't know how much work had been done uh, uh, and how much interest was, was already in Latin America. And I, I showed up to a, a meetup, a uh, half a day event in, in Bogota, where there was over a hundred uh, librarians in the room. Mm. Uh, and by the end of the, the meeting, those of us who were presenting, we just stopped, we backed up because uh, there was so much conversation happening within the room that the, the uh, I guess like the group effervescence had taken over <laughs> and they were looking and talking about how could they um, uh, participate in, in the project, especially that they would be participating in a global project. They would be working with, in collaboration with, uh, you know, colleagues uh, at Cornell and Chalmers and, you know, th throughout the world. Best part was when I was kind of making a joke that, you know, I, I can stand back here now and, and I can let you guys uh, organize. Uh, there was a librarian that, that, that stood up and said, well, it's, it's really the secret weapon of, of Folio is not, the, is not the software being generated. Yeah. It's the actual community. That's the mm -hmm. feeling in the global community that's, that's starting to, uh, to, to percolate. I think that is so true. I mean, I remember the very first uh, meetup we held was in Copenhagen, and it was sort of a spontaneous thing. The three of us were there, and, and we said, "Well, why don't we invite people, people together?" And, <laughs> and, and people ended. People came from like six or seven different European countries. Some of them pretty far away, and but 
we were really the only ones there that could speak to Folio, and, and we hadn't done a very good job planning it because we didn't really know what a Folio meetup would look like. And we were sort of we were putting the agenda together in the breaks between sessions, <laughs> and at some point it became kind of a panic trying to come up with something to do. But it was really a great conversation, but it also felt like we were carrying it. And now we, we get to attend these events. Well, really, you know, we can we can say a few words, but other people have more substance to add than mm. to do. That's been huge. And, and the and the thing about the community growing, it, it, it is more important in the so than the software in the sense that the software will need to change over time. Mm -hmm. and the community and the community support uh, around this that will be really important for the sustainability and the innovation that we're all looking for to come out of this platform. Without the community, you can have killer developers and they can turn out some really good code and then there it sits. Um, you really need these people who are using it, pushing it around, with fully cognizant that it is a malleable, flexible platform. You can make changes in it. Uh, you can contribute those back to the community, to the larger community, and, and, uh, and they can be sustained. The efforts that you put in can become part of, of what everyone is using or what everyone has the opportunity to use, at least. You know, on that point, too, is you, when we think about that, you think about the institutions that are investing time and, and resources into this, but... I also think about the, the vendors and service providers that Sorry. that we, <laughs> <laughs> I do too. <laughs> the vendors and service providers that are that are engaged because they they are investing in a way of understanding that this platform is part of their future, and that you know, organizations like you know Quilto and and App Cults, Stacks, um, Frontside, these are organizations that that realize that um, that investment. Um, uh, it will, will help them in the future on, on their business models, but it also helps the community because they're going to be using this software and will also, uh, uh, because of their engagement with the software, they will keep the software going and continue to, to move it forward. That diversity is super important. Uh, yeah, and it is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> one of the, I think one of the, the small but really, really, I think, important moments for me was uh, somewhere in the middle of this year, a group of us from Olay and from, from EBSCO and Index Data visited a, a major research library in the US and, and had a fairly broad conversation with different stakeholders about Folio, where it was headed from a, a data model perspective, workflows, technology, and so on. At the, at the end of the day, there was sort of a group that got together to say, well, so what do we think? How do we feel about this? And there was a fairly substantial group of, of IT staff from the library in the room who just said with one voice, we like Folio. Uh, this is how we would build a system if we were going to build it ourselves. We hmm. want to run this. We want to, we want to work with this. And I don't, I'm not, I don't want to steal credit for that for, for, for us or for, for index data because putting together the platform the basic foundational technology was a collaborative effort. People from from Olay, from from EBSCO, architects, developers. Uh, um, but I just remember, you know, two years ago, at the very beginning of this project, just the just the, the sort of worry, the nod in my stomach, at least, of of wanting to come up, wanting so badly to come up with a foundational technology that would be able to carry the level of ambition that we all have for this project and the potential mm -hmm. we have. And I think somewhere around the middle of this year, feeling like we had we made it, we, we pulled it off. We we built something that was strong enough to carry us forward. That felt pretty. Uh, that felt big for me. I think another standout moment too is the opportunity that individuals have been given in the project yeah. uh, to step up, and people have, and they they've taken on substantial uh, responsibilities within the project. Mm. Uh, and 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 in general, this is in addition to their day job. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, that there are lots of people who are contributing, uh, certainly as, as an aspect of the, their institutional interest in Folio, um, but they're really serving this greater community that, that they're really trying to take in uh, a lot of uh, different opinions and viewpoints, uh, uh, environments that libraries live in, and accommodate those in some kind of sensible fashion um, uh, that allows us to move forward with good software. 
I think there's a tone. I mean, for, one thing that's happened this year, I think, is that Folio has developed its own culture in a certain sense. There's a language, right? And it, it feels it's welcoming. It feels like a nice place to be. And, and mm, hopefully so. Yeah, yeah we, we, uh, we early on, you know, it's not, you know, if they build it, you know, if we build it, they will come, we think. We had that, uh, that worry of, um, and even as we, we spoke about uh, pulling the six together and to, to let it organically come together and organize, there was, we think this is going to work, but there was those moments of, okay, this is, uh, this is kind of scary. Well, well, to play off the metaphor, you know, what was the crop that we, we plowed under to build that, <laughs> that baseball diamond that uh, people come to? And, and there was substantial investment. Uh, in the beginning to to just craft the idea and kind of set some patterns and, and then bring a lot of people to it. Well, there was a leap of faith that, that people would come and that it would all work out with, in, in some sense, I think we started, there was sort of a, 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 a culture of agility uh, that affected the project, both in terms of how we looked at the technology, but also how we talked about the community. We said, let's try to start with as little as we can and build it out. And, and there were certainly moments of growing pains in the first year and a half, two years. Mm -hmm. There was also, there's been an, a, a huge amount of good faith and people just saying, okay, some, this is not working, let's try to fix it. Mm -hmm. we, all, we all want to get to the same place. And that's just worked incredibly well. It really has. And, and I mean, it is a danger in these kinds of projects because there's no fiat from some administrator that says you will all work together and do this. Uh, the, that trust is really a critical piece of how this project has moved so quickly and effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think, and let's hit on, uh, um, there was challenges there because we, uh, we have multiple organizations here, multiple cultures. No. And you know, even within, uh, you know, coming from EBSCO, um, uh, and I, I've also worked with, with other companies, uh, you think of the cultures that exist even within a company. You work at an institution, you have cultures within the institution, not a single culture, but many times, uh, you know, there's, there's complexity there. Now you bring together multiple institutions, multiple uh, uh, vendors or companies, you know, the complexity gets harder and, and, and more and more difficult. And I'm amazed with, um, uh, you know, not to say that we haven't had pains once in a while and, uh, you know, issues once in a while, but I'm amazed of how that we've been able to work through things uh, with that with that that goal of what we're trying to deliver as a larger community. So the standout moment could be that we're all still together. <laughs> that you're all still standing, yeah. <laughs> so I, I do want to, you know, uh, pause and, and remind folks that uh, using the, the Q&A box or Twitter, uh, you can uh, ask your questions uh, of our three panelists, and uh, uh, we'll include those in the discussion. I, but you know, in, in the past, you, you know, couple minutes, you guys have talked uh, a lot about uh, you know anxiety of of the past, and and you know, if if we if it's built, will people come? And and uh, how do we form ourselves to make this effective? I, what do you think? the riskiest thing will be in the next year that the project will need to overcome? Um, and, well, I saw this in the Olay project as we, as we developed our code out and got to the point where um, there were going to be implementations and deployments, is software development communities have a certain characteristic uh, and you have to begin pivoting somewhat. Uh, away from a, a laser-like focus on what's the functionality we need, how do we describe it, how do we code it, how do we test it, um, uh, those sort of things, to you're gonna, we're going to have people who are running the code, who are actually using it uh, to run their libraries, uh, who will have issues, questions. Um, they may even, you know, positively, they may have questions and issues about could we use it this way rather than the way we've been using our, our typical ILS software. Um, but there, you know, clearly will be uh, support issues and, and, and those sort of things. Pivoting some of our community around those kinds of concerns will be a challenge uh, and, a, and a risk in the sense that, again, you can develop really good software, 
um, and people can be impressed with it, but if it's really hard to install or run or something like that, it's not going to be particularly successful. There's a real serenity to working on software that has no users. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So as a security uh, officer, I always said we could just disconnect all of our computers <laughs> and we'd be good. I, I think it's that, um, uh, again, as we move towards uh, sites that are uh, that have it installed and they're, they're running it, there's the, the conversation that moves into um, what comes next. You know, after that, uh, that version one, that, that beta, um, uh, once you have sites running, the, the, the core ILS functionality, there's that conversation of, well, what comes next? What's, what's the prioritization? And I think of you know, how the... Um, how the project, uh, even the product council has had four charters since the beginning of the project because it has grown organically and it's, it, it, it has morphed um, as the project has changed. And you know, we will continue to morph into uh, a more, um, uh, uh, a, a design or str uh, strong uh, governance where we've had kind of a looser governance right now, but how that happens, I mean, that's the piece that is... So that's the work for this year. That's, yeah, that's, that's the, the work, and that's the, you know, that's probably the hard work. I mean, the, the, the entire project up to this point has worked around the shared roadmap that has been fairly uncontroversial in a sense because it's been basic stuff that you couldn't really disagree that you needed to be able to manage things like inventory and patrons and so on. Mm -hmm. and I think we will get into the to the to the need of things. We'll see in the second half of of next year. We'll see us moving up beyond into to more experimental features and things that are more exotic. And we probably will see a, a more interesting conversation around our shared roadmap. And we'll we'll be managing a larger group of of stakeholders uh, as well. Mm. Even as we deal with deployment issues and and, right. and actual users of the software. Right. Because if, if you think that right now it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a smaller group that is looking at where that line is on development, we're going to have more and more uh, organizations coming in. We have more and more organizations that are implementing and more voices on where is that, um, uh, what makes sense for where that line lands and what's above it and what's below it. Mm. And, and some tension around how resources get used as well because even though the three of us have all uh, expressed um, uh, the thought that the community will continue to grow. It's a, it's a finite community. Uh, and there's so, only so many hours and so much effort that can be applied. So prioritization will become uh, more critical uh, to think about how we service uh, organizations that are running the code um, and, the, and the promise of developing new and innovative uh, approaches. There's a tension between those kinds of things uh, when you have limited resources, and we'll need to navigate that. Mm. I mean, we see uh, by the end of end of next year uh, a number of organizations starting to uh, to adopt either you know whole hog or portions, and uh, you know, that's that's the conversations that will happen as the as the software is being uh, adopted. That's that will be interesting. I mean, we hear of, we, we have conversations within index data of things we want to do with the platform beyond traditional wireless functions. We know that similar conversations take place at OLA, at EBSCO, and that there are conversations like these amongst all of the stakeholders and people that are looking at the platform. And that balance, the point at which they're, they're, there's a split and we start to be able to direct effort towards some of those other activities is, is something we discuss a lot uh, uh, back at index data, and, and it, it isn't clear at what point it makes sense. I think we reach a point where there's saturation around the core, the current library management functionality, and we can say, as a community, we could just we could stop at that point, we could split up, or we could figure out some way to manage a conversation that's broader than, than just library administration. And how does that look? We don't really know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, but critically, new voices coming in, a new right. diversity yeah. will be important. You know, we've just come out of CNI, as you noted, uh, uh, Peter, and lots of conversations there were around research data uh, and, and repository infrastructure and, and 
um, some resiliency to preservation, uh, those sort of issues. And, you know, I don't want to be accused of, uh, you know, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, but in almost every one of these conversations, it's, you know, folios seem to have a relevancy to me. And, and those are conversations that we'd really like to, uh, to, to jumpstart and, and get going so that we can see whether there's really anything there. Mm. Mm -hmm. I've had, uh, I've had numerous conversations in the last month with, um, uh, I would say more um, uh, UL level or Dean level strategists and the conversations around uh, um, library futures or leadership strategy, where they start to talk about the Folio platform as more of a platform to think, That's a right. platform to speak out, a platform to uh, envision, uh, you know, more of a speaker's platform That's than exactly an right. actual you know, software platform. Mm. I'm finding that really interesting as well, that I hope more and more of those voices start to engage. Um, uh, and, and we have you know, groups that just talk about these ideas of where we're, where we're headed. Well, that's what's so excited about, exciting about Folio, right? Because a, 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 again, a piece of open source software is, is, is software, it's code, it does a job, but it's also a focal point for a conversation with Folio the scope of, of the platform can be anything people want it to be. So the conversation can be almost anything. And, and, and the conversation can be about change management. It can be about the future. It can be about strategy. And, <laughs> and there's an interest in that conversation. And again, that, that, that split is interesting. The, the, the balance between here's the stuff we're actually doing, here's the code we're writing, and then the ideation, you know, just letting people dream about what's possible, uh, brainstorm. Um, that's one of the really fun things about going out and talking to people about Folio. Mm -hmm. It's so broad. Yeah. Uh, partially because it's, it's not a, um, uh, it's, it's not an approach of coming to an organization and saying, here's, here is something, buy it. Right. It's more of a, this is something that we're, we're building. There will be organizations that will host and support it. Um, but, but where do we need to go with this? And, what are, what are the directions and what are we actually, uh, what are the problems that we're trying to solve uh, now um, in three years and in five years? Mm -hmm. it's, I mean, it's a shared conversation about strategy that's also anchored in something really concrete you know, that, that can get you, that can potentially there's a very short distance from a, an open-ended strategy conversation to let's, hey, let's write some code. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, we would hope that uh, we'd see a lot of that at, of at least uh, people beginning to stand up some prototypes and some ideas. Uh, and then uh, maybe other groups pick it up and help them uh, see that through to fruition, we really hope. I mean, we have a, we have a, 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 in some ways, a common space that we put in, not just developers, but also thinkers, product owners, and very, very close to my heart, UX people. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea that you can perhaps have, have use Folio as a forum where people with ideas can move people with resources to carry out some of those ideas. And that's right. That, that's just really exciting. And, and I mean, you know, that's one of the rationales for um, libraries, small libraries to join into the effort is you may think that you have to have developers and, and you know, all of the staff that you can put into it, but um, you can also contribute ideas. And, yeah. uh, and there will be people who, who have the capacity and the resources to do something with those ideas if they're good. Well, I'd say props to EBSCO for instituting the innovation grants yeah. fairly early on, early on in the process. And yeah, that's been a really neat move yeah. to just stimulate that kind of conversation. Yeah, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been exciting and the amount of um, uh, organizations that have reached out to say, we have an idea, uh, can you help us flush, you know, flush this out a bit? And, uh, um, and then they, they head off and have, some of them have come back with um, full grants. Uh, mm. right. well, Mm -hmm. So, you know, related to uh, some of the risks we were, were talking about earlier, uh, it comes a, a question from the audience. Uh, has the project considered establishing a, a registered folio service provider status, uh, something that expresses some kind of uh, level of commitment and, and expertise uh, to, and, and in doing so, uh, helping the, the community find uh, qualified service partners? Um, I don't think we talk very much about that, but it's certainly been an idea in, in my own mind that 
that we, we need to offer to the larger community, a, a set of service providers uh, that can be relied on, that lots of libraries are going to want to look at it in that, that kind of deployment configuration. Uh, so providing some kind of certification uh, makes sense. A corollary question could be, would there be training uh, available as well? Mm -hmm. uh, training both for developers who want to contribute or uh, be involved in development and training for implementers, for, for the, the system managers and libraries and for the, the unit managers uh, who have to think about changes in workflow and those sort of things. Yeah. There's a whole set of sort of support uh, uh, issues um, that are ripe for uh, commercial interest to come in and, and set themselves up as folio service providers. It is in the interest of the community to say, yeah, they, they know what they're talking about. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They follow best practices. And, you know, we've had, just in passing, a conversation about this. And, and also, um, uh, even looking at uh, um, development groups that can be considered, or organizations that be considered sustainers, right. where they are groups that, um, uh, that there are service providers that also um, declare that they, they, they either contribute to the... Uh, uh, the core, um, or they, they put money towards development, et cetera. The other thing about service providers, I, I mentioned commercial ones and that it's a ripe area, but we also know, and, and there are active participants in the projects who are service providers, non-commercial service providers, uh, like consortia, mm. uh, and library networks who have a long uh, relationship with their clientele, with their communities, uh, to provide services. Boy, did we see that in Germany at the Stuttgart thing. Oh, absolutely. Uh, of how the library networks in Germany um, uh, really can coordinate a conversation and a set of services that, that libraries are, are um, uh, find attractive mm -hmm. uh, and become um, uh, reliant on through those library networks. I think, I, I think it's, a, it's a notion of certifying service providers. It's, it's great. I, it, it isn't something we've talked about as much as we should. We have had conversations about certifying apps, the mm. idea of, of programs or mechanisms you could set up to, to blue stamp apps so suitable for, for local operation, operation in the hosting environment. But the idea of coming together as a community to say what, what we would like to see from a service provider, I think will be very important. Mm -hmm. We have a, a compliment and a, a question from someone else. Uh, first, the compliment. Uh, the infrastructure concepts uh, seem uh, to work out very well. Uh, and then the question, uh, how about migration concepts or roadmaps? Uh, could, they be, uh, could they become a, a group or community effort too? I think absolutely. Um, I think we're seeing some of the, the, the major libraries within Olay in particular are looking at setting up internal conversations um, uh, to plan for migration themselves. And there is a, a, a SIG, uh, as you know, Peter, focusing on, on, on DevOps issues in general. I would expect that to be at least initially a focal point for those kinds of conversations. Mm -hmm. And we want to see tools for migration and best practices for migration being something that we can curate as a community. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I would say also that uh, roadmap, um, roadmap, initial roadmap was uh, at least, you know, really focusing on what is the, uh, the, the base uh, uh, functionality that needs to be in place for, for uh, version one, or beta and version one, um, was part of a, a community conversation at least a, um, there was a, a gathering of, of features and a conversation on a test. But I would see, I would see that growing into even more of a community process yeah. and uh, even a, 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 a community process even around the, uh, the person who, who manages the roadmap. Yeah. Um, that guidance for that person and then also um, that that person you know, changes role, that there's a new person in that role every couple of years. Um, I, I really see this as a, uh, a way that the community then is truly in, uh, engaged in, uh, in that roadmap. Right, and, and I mean, those roles really commit organizations to, to the project uh, too. So we want to open that up and, and make it a real community process because it's just part of the community growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know, uh, 
sitting in on the uh, uh, reporting SIG, uh, one of the things that we're talking about there is the, the need for moving over retrospective transactions uh, uh, into Folio so that we can do reports on uh, past purchase orders, for instance. So uh, yeah, this, this question of, of uh, migration of data uh, comes up in, in a number of places. It's a migration of processes and models and workflows and loan rules. It, it's, it's a massive task. All that little bizarre software that you've written around your ILS, mm -hmm. uh, uh, those sort of things. So yeah, migrations will be taking up a, a lot of our thinking this year. So uh, in the next question, I have a test for you. Uh, the, uh, uh, no one told me there'd be tests. <laughs> We'll, we'll see if you remember, and if not, uh, I'll pull up the, the roadmap myself. The, the uh, question from a, a participant says, uh, which applications, uh, for example, uh, acquisitions, cataloging, et cetera, uh, are gonna be included in the 2018 release? For V1. For V1. I, I assume, yeah, the, the no. first production release. Yeah. I assume so, yes. I mean, it's, it's a long list. Uh, it, it's intended to, to cover all of the primary sort of business objects. Uh, you know, the, in, in Folio, we have less a focus on, on domains like acquisitions and cataloging and more on the types of objects that you need to manipulate. So for, for acquisitions, it's things like purchase orders and uh, vendors, uh, licenses, and, and so on. And, and, yeah. So mm -hmm. it, it's kind of expected to be all of them as far as, as this next summer is concerned. We want to have enough stuff there that you can do a migration. What will be missing will be some of the, the process glue to tie things together. So the workflow management piece that's being worked on will not be part of, uh, of, of the release next summer, um, but will be coming in afterwards. But but it's supposed the attempt is really to cover the full suite of uh, of business objects. I think the way we've stated it is that it it will be a system capable of replacing a current generation ILS. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of the functionality that you would expect from from a current product uh, should be there in some way or another. Well, and and Kate, uh, the the project's lead. Uh, product owner has has spoken about uh, different phases of development the the rough in phase where uh, the basic business object is there and the, the, the basic create read update delete functions are there uh, and then the refinement stage um, and you know it, and looking at the, the suite of, of folio apps that are in development right now I think the only one that has made it to the refinement stage is the users app uh, which is also the one that we've been work that we started working on first, mm -hmm. um, and you know, doing all of this learning and, and toolkit building along the way. Uh, that's the app that has reached uh, the the refinement stage, and um, I, I, I think you know another way of putting this is we'll we'll have the rough ends for all of those major uh, business objects, and and what comes next is is the refinement and, and particularly in discussion with the SIGs. And, and there'll be a new channel to that refinement conversation too, because this will be beta software by that point. There'll be stood up versions of Folio that have local data in it and, and people will be pushing back their experiences uh, into the project. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, there's a pipeline process, right? And, and, and part of the reason that you can't answer exactly is because we didn't come into to, to the project with a full list of saying these are the things we'll do, this is how things will, will, will look. It's evolved very much organically. There's sort of a multi-level agile process to it. And, and each of these apps are working through a pipeline of processes starting with the UX-centric analysis, going into development, and then moving from there into to continuous refinements. Um, so all of the apps exist at this point as UX prototypes, and I'd say a majority of them exist as, as evolving prototypes in code yeah. that are developed in parallel by multiple individual dev teams. So a dev team is typically around 
three to five developers, a product owner associated with a SIG and a UX person. So there's there's a number of these being passing through the system in parallel. What's interesting is is in this development too is with the uh, as the UX toolkit um, is uh, is being worked on, as the UI toolkit is being delivered, you see um, and being refined, you see pieces of it suddenly pop across all of the different apps mm -hmm. where you see notes, you know, suddenly bang, it's across uh, a number of, yeah. of apps. So, yeah, so you see, yeah. you, you, you know, even as the, um, the app has been roughed in, um, as a refinement happens, it's happening in numerous places at once. The apps also are all uh, version. Um, and, uh, you know, so in this list that none of us can generate <laughs> off the top of our head. Um, well, we're doing a good job <laughs> kind of thinking it. That's it. Uh, <laughs> uh, since they are version, though, if there's one in particular that people are concerned with or, or, or they have ideas about what they would need in order to really uh, take the next step of standing it up and, and pushing it around a little bit, um, there's there's indications of what code is more mature than other code. Mm, mm -hmm. to, to Christopher's point about seeing something like notes show up, it, it, it's been sort of interesting to me that when we first, when we first started talking about Folio as a, as a platform with an app store, I think the, the, the first public presentation was at Code for Lit last, last year. And we just kind of drew this, this box with boxes inside of it. We didn't really have a clue what an app would look like in something like, like Folio. We, we talked about being inspired by smartphones, but we knew full well that it wouldn't be anything like that. And one of the, one of the really interesting things from my perspective that's come out of this year is seeing the idea of Folio as an app-based environment evolve. So the idea of notes came out of the UX process and was pushed into the development stream. It wasn't something that we really imagined from the beginning, so we have a much more mature sense now of, of an idea of an ecosystem of apps that, that work independently but rely on shared functions like the like annotation, the uh, uh, breadcrumb system, uh, bookmarking mechanisms, and so on. That's been just really cool to see evolve completely organically uh, mm -hmm. out of, out of a, a, a uh, a UX and design approach. Even bizarre pieces of functionality that in hindsight are just dead simple, yeah. you know, um, in the project like preserving state in, a, in an inherently stateless environment right. uh, so that you can go, what you can start work and go away and come back to it and return to the same mm -hmm. uh, place that you were, um, were innovations that probably weren't in our original thinking but came through the SIG process through the discussions uh, uh, with people who would be using the software who, who would let us know that's not the way humans work. <laughs> mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. That they have different processes. Well, and you know, even, you know, just kind of stepping back a level uh, through the Folio project, we're also getting ed an education as to how software is built. Um, that it, it doesn't, you know, just kind of spring forth uh, uh, finished completely. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm kind of reflecting on, on in my own career, uh, I remember years ago, there was this weird anonymous survey uh, about, you know, how do you think about uh, your, your library search software? Uh, you and, gotta be careful about opening those emails. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Uh, and, and, you know, I answered the survey, but I was also like curious about who was behind it because, you know, there wasn't any, any indication of, of who the company was or what the product was or anything. And, and then suddenly someone sprang forth, our, our first uh, unified index. And, and, you know, there wasn't really anything between that time where somebody's got this weird idea and they're doing this weird survey until suddenly, boom, you know, there, there was uh, our first unified index. With the Folio project, it's quite different. And, and it's, you know, it's a quite a, a different message in that we're watching the software develop as, as, the, as the kind of community evolves and, and their requirements evolve and, and the user experience testing discussions evolve. Uh, you know, really getting an education as to how, you know, software behind the scenes is built. It, it's, a, it's a really good point, but it's basically the, um, 
the community is involved in the sausage making. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, uh, and in, in past experience, you know, outside of open source, it's, yeah, you, you, you work with the community, you talk to the community, then you go away and you build something and you bring it back where uh, this is, and you know, we talk about um, alpha, beta, version one, that's, that, those are just milestones we're tossing out there. You can go to GitHub today yeah. and, and pull down the code or you can yeah. pull, pull up a vagrant box and you know, yeah. there it is. Go it's, to the, the main UX site and see the evolving prototypes. Yeah. Prototypes uh, of yeah. development, which are sort of the targets that we're going for. Yeah. Uh, and you can even lens between those and the code that's actually be, been delivered, yeah. uh, the working code. So, you know, everything is as open and transparent as we can we can possibly make it, or, or we're trying at least, um, you know, all the way from uh, the, the code that you can look at and, and read uh, to the SIG uh, meetings that you can join uh, and participate in, or even just lurk on the mailing list, the discuss channels, the Slack channels, all of these things are, are just there. And you can see us having these conversations about things. So uh, another uh, observation uh, from the audience, and, and that is that we've got a, a diverse uh, community of people involved. And, and so this person is, is wondering uh, about uh, uh, automatic translations, like Google Translation type of service within the platform. Uh, but I really want to extend that to, to maybe thinking about uh, what is the role of, of the of a, a multinational community uh, in making sure that that folio meets the needs of each region. So my first thought is um, there have been some organizations that uh, even there was one organization that um, from Spain that, that was at the first uh, uh, folio meetup in Copenhagen that. Uh, they have said that you know they will approach and translate uh, the the interface. Mm. Uh, in the Spanish, we have this also from Calus and a designer uh, in Taiwan, uh, IBICT uh, image in um, in Brazil. Uh, they have talked about doing this in um, Portuguese. Uh, Mangus Quilto in Hungary, uh, looking at Eastern and Central European languages. So it it's. Um, in many ways, it's the local community that says, we want to adopt this. One way that they, um, that looks like they're engaging is uh, the, the, the lowest um, you know, bar of entry into uh, joining this is to let us start to translate. But there'll be others too, particularly as the software matures to, to deployment capable software about integrations, which tend to be mm. regionalized as well. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, those of us who are in the U.S. well yeah. know the vendors that we integrate with uh, within U.S. higher education. There's a handful of uh, university type systems that, that we're targeting to integrate with. And then you go over to Europe and you talk to our European uh, sure. uh, participants and, and there's similar but different uh, structures there that, that we need to uh, uh, be able to accommodate. So there'll be some flexibility even in, in those kinds of places uh, where people can participate. I think that's exactly right. I mean, the, the, the easy answer is that we were always aware because the community was global from the very beginning that, that we couldn't make this not localizable. You know, you had to have your, your strings in good places. You had to have support for local languages and dates and currencies and so on. But, but, but the, the, the need to adapt the system, to have the system be flexible and adaptable to local practices for resource sharing, for copy cataloging, even for acquisitions, acquisitions. was critical, yeah, right? Local, yeah. uh, different rules for, 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 for and practices around privacy, uh, mm. very different drives pushing you know, privacy in one way or another in different places. Um, and even how you deploy the software. Yeah. Can you deploy uh, it in, in a cloud hosted in there? So, I mean, one of our hopes is that, that the whole the App Store concept, the very high level of modularity of Folio, will all else being equal make it easier for people to adapt it to local needs, uh, to, to build plug-in for local services, to say, 
adapt the system to deal with practices for circulation or so on that are specific to a country. Excellent, excellent. So we're we're starting to uh, uh, get to the to the close of our time now. We've got about uh, fifteen minutes left. I, I wanted to ask you know the the, the three of you, uh, what's the the neatest new thing that Folio does, and what's the neatest old thing that Folio rethinks? Hmm. Hmm. Well, I have when when, when they think. Uh, uh, well, they, these guys think. Yeah, I have, I have the, the neatest old thing that I think Folio rethinks isn't really in the software itself, but in the process. I, I, I think the thing that has impressed me the most this year has been the process that we've set up for approaching the requirements to the system through a, a user-centric, through a UX-driven process. Um, and, it, and there's, there's multiple different aspects to it. I mean, one of them is that I, I feel that it is, it empowers non-developers to steer and direct and assist developers in ways that, um, that you just can't do with, with any other sort of mode of expressing your needs. I think it's been a great boon for developers because they get a really precise language for, for, for looking at and to deal with requirements. But really kind of the, a big part of it and this is this is i have to give sort of massive credits here to the to the our lead ux specialist who came in cold from outside of the library domain but with a real gift for boiling things down to the essentials and thinking outside of the box and he's been working individually with subject matter experts in multiple different groups and not only help work through their workflows and processes but also think at a high level, at a meta level of what a platform like Folio should look like. So a lot of these uh, cross-platform functions like annotation and navigation have come out of, of, of his vision and has helped sort of inspire a process, a mode of working together in Folio that I'm sort of hoping that I could imagine other people picking it up. It's now, as, as you guys say, it's a group of five or six uh, uh, UX people working together with them, and it's become a mode of working that 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 we take very seriously in the projects. Um, that the the UX process is is king, and that's what we as developers are working towards. That's what we what we track towards. And from the from the librarian side of things, I think that it's been just a winning success as yeah. well because uh, it allows uh, multiple parallel processes to to really make progress and see their progress instantiated in the uh, in the prototype uh, site so that they feel very comfortable with uh, it's it's understood the functionality that that we're trying to describe um, and with confidence that it can go off to the developers and that it will return um, looking like that and working like that um, so it has allowed people to put a lot of effort in when when frankly in the background there hasn't been the resources to develop that code out um, in you know, in a, a, a synchronous kind of uh, way. It allows the project to shift um, priorities around, to shift resources around, uh, but everybody keeps working uh, while they're doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I mean, in the agile terminology, we have a very healthy uh, backlog of things yeah. to do because mm -hmm. people have been quite busy uh, refining uh, relatively complex workflows for the last year. So, so yeah, that's that's been... I, I think a, um, I think another thing that's really different and, and exciting for me is uh, that we have this relationship between vendors and organizations, institutions that we're, we're, we're partnering in this space in a whole new way. That it's, um, uh, as, as you, Michael, a bunch of times say, of uh, supply chain and institution uh, in, a, in a pure relationship. And, you know, again, we have, we have cultures that we're, we wrestle with at times, but, uh, um, uh, but not physically, just <laughs> this hasn't three done. of you in the room. <laughs> we'll turn the camera off. You can listen to them. <laughs> this, this hasn't been done in, uh, in libraries in this, uh, this scale. Uh, in, I find it, uh, I find it really exciting. It, I mean, yeah, to just build on that, it, it has been one of the, 
more interesting aspects of growing folio from those initial conversations is how do you really make this work? How do you really uh, set up a collaborative environment uh, with participants from both commercial and non-commercial uh, organizations and drive forward an agenda that meets everybody's goals in that? Um, uh, it's just been wonderful to see how it can happen. Uh, but frankly, I think that it, it is a critical piece to this long-term sustainability. Uh, lots of open source projects uh, come up with really good ideas, but ultimately run into sustainability issues and, and have to make some hard decisions about um, uh, what do they do with the effort and ideas that they put in. Um, having this hybrid kind of uh, organization where there are commercial um, entities, where there are large service providers, both commercial and non-commercial, and, and a lot of libraries uh, who are engaged in this gives me real confidence that any given uh, participant uh, can uptrend or downtrend their involvement. And overall, it's not going to impact negatively mm. uh, the project. Mm -hmm. I think uh, from my perspective, when, when we first began talking about folio and earnest, um, I was, I think all of the participants have been in awe of the, of the scope and the opportunity to, 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 to do something that was really desired by a lot of people to really have an impact. Um, but so, so there was a lot of respect and a lot of, you know, went into the task with a certain, uh, a certain amount of respect for it, but it also felt like something that index data had prepared for, for, for our whole existence. But I'm, I'm truly in awe of the distance that Olay has traveled and the distance that EBSCO has traveled in order to come to this place. I mean, mm. the big, big organizations and complex multilayered organizations that, that, that have that, a history. Yeah, <laughs> that, have, that have history, that, yeah. that have come to the space. And it's, it's not been easy. Um, um, and, and I've gotten to watch it firsthand. And I, I really am impressed at the, the level of, of, of faith and the, the, the kind of determination with which they've come at this. Uh, from my own side, I think, you know, the, 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 the neatest thing about Folio, the, the, the sort of neatest accomplishment, I think is on the, 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 on the technology side itself. You know, we, we spent probably the first half year of Folio just worrying about this platform concept, you know, Mm. Well, they came to Folio with a vision for an ecosystem that, that, it, that would enable libraries and vendors to work together. EBSCO, I, I think I would credit EBSCO with coming up with the idea of the App Store as, as a driving metaphor. And they sort of laid these things on the table and said, hey, index data, can you make this a reality? And we spent literally months and months and months thinking about how to do this and how to do it in a way that would be appealing and approachable for developers and and what was astonishing ultimately was how everything boiled down to something that was very simple you know, mm. you, to know you have a, a good architecture when it's got few moving parts and folio really just has two it has a copy and it has stripes the ui toolkit and it works because it leans on 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 the infrastructure it leans on cloud hosting technologies and, and to see that come to life and be embraced by the developer community has just been a huge like, treat and relief and, and, and joy for me. You know, and it's interesting, it, it, it kind of touches on the, the uh, final question we've got from a, an audience member. And, and that's with, you know, with the, the development tools selected, databases, programming languages, and so forth how confident are you that they are the right ones to last for the next five, 10, 15, 20 years? Well, that's just it. We're absolutely confident that they're not. <laughs> well, that, and, oh, well, that's the key. And that's really, that's what the, that was what caused the panic because we, the, the sort of initial survey or the initial conversations revealed that there wasn't any tool we could have picked that wouldn't annoy 80% of developers. And, and even if we found one that only annoyed 70% of developers, it would be the wrong tool in five years. So the whole focus of the, the architecture of, of, of folios built around not choosing specific tools, but we lean on web services. 
we lean on on the idea of of the cloud, which is really fundamentally based on the idea of, of, of you know hosting and web services, portable pieces of code, which feels like it isn't it is not a fad; it's a trend. And and cloud technologies are informing the way that that operating systems and Unix Linux in particular is is, is evolving. So. I think it's entirely possible that in 10 years, Folio is going to be based on entirely different technologies. I don't think that the UI toolkit will have, you know, a shelf life much beyond five years because they never do, but that's okay because it, it's, it's replaceable. Um, mm -hmm. By the same token, I think the technologies that people like to use on the back end will change and change fast. And that's okay too. One of the ideas that, that we put forward really early was to try to, build Folio in such a way that no component was too big to throw away. Um, and we've been able to stay with that, even, even though copy and, and stripes are not that big. Uh, and, and what they do are, are fairly simple things. And I really would like to just uh, you know, say, and people should think about this, given that, that replaceability, that, that design concept, that, that architectural concept that things are going to age out and need yeah. to be replaced, Let's think about that from the librarian perspective of how difficult it is to change workloads and how long and how much effort, thought, and discussion have gone in about how libraries need to change and, and directions to go. And we keep finding ourselves somewhat hemmed in by the technologies that we use. Having technology that is designed to be malleable, having, having the ability to replace um, uh, data models or even the data structure, uh, you know, the databases that we use becomes critical uh, tools for libraries who want to take those conversations to uh, an implementation stage to develop something out and say, here's a new way of thinking about uh, cataloging. Here's a new way of thinking about metadata production or, or how we uh, uh, manage uh, holdings and licensing and those sort of things. Here's ways that we can address some of those things that have held us back or required libraries to invest enormous amounts of staff in downtrending parts of our business. Um, the design of the architecture is meant to be resilient that Folio will be available for, for the long term, but it's designed to change should be seen as an enormous uh, benefit for libraries because we, we need to change what we're doing while we're still doing the things that we have to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and finding a technology platform that can accommodate those two, um, uh, you know, not just interests, but uh, really, uh, you know, lifeblood for libraries is, is difficult and was one of the most attractive things about Folio as a concept. The, the, the final point on that, uh, as well, is that the idea that uh, the community also has then the ability and the power to make those changes as uh, technologies change, that you're not waiting on uh, external. You can you can go forward as a community Absolutely. to flip these out. It's a community on the ecosystem. Yeah. So I, um, each of you, about uh, half a minute. Uh, any uh, closing thoughts before we end for the day? I don't know what it will be. I mean, I think Folio has been a, a just an amazing journey. This this year has been sort of a change, a face change into to uh, app development mode, into large scale collaboration, and it continues to be to exceed my expectations. You know, and I can't take credit for for most of the success, uh, but it is nice to see that you know early conversations come to fruition in such amazing ways uh, with such support activity. Uh, the amount of effort that people have put in, the thought, the, the creativity uh, that they brought to it has been really rewarding to yeah. see. You know, I, I think um, after this, uh, uh, this, was, this was a great session for us, I think, yeah. just to be able to stop and the, the, the speed that we're moving and the amount of work that's happening, uh, a lot of times you just, I mean, it's just every day and you, right. you keep moving and you keep moving and keep moving. There's a, this moment here that this was really nice to pause and say, wow, look at what we have done in, in a year and a half. I think, you know, when you look at that for the community coming up as well, say, you know, we need to all pause and, and say, wow, look at this. Look at, uh, look at what we've, we've done in the last year. It's pretty remarkable. It feels incredible. So let's look forward to uh, December next year. We'll have to uh, uh, 
do this again and, and see where the, the community has gone uh, in the next 12 months. Got it. Uh, so this concludes today's end of the year review of the Folio project. Uh, you can continue the conversation at the Folio discussion website, discuss.folio.org, and on Twitter using the hashtag Folio Forum. The recording of today's forum will be posted soon to the openlibrary.org website. Uh, if you have any feedback on this forum or an idea for a future forum, uh, please contact the forum facilitators at facilitators at olay-lists.openlibraryfoundation.org. Uh, our next folio forum will be on January 17th with the topic, What's the Buzz? An Introduction to APIs in Libraries. Uh, we will have an announcement soon on that same website uh, with more details and the link to register. Uh, thank you to our panelists today, uh, Michael Winkler, Christopher Spaulding, Sebastian Hammer, uh, and thank you to everyone who asked questions and added comments. Uh, it's been a great year for Folio, and I'm looking forward to a greater year next year. Uh, we'll talk next time. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.